Today we're going to be looking at uh, Psalm 106. I'm not going to read the entire psalm and enter into it. We'll basically begin by reading verses 1 through 5. I'll give you an introduction as to what the context of it is, and then we're going to move on through. And as we go through it, you're going to be seeing how it breaks down and basically gives us um, various passages that we'll look at, and I'll give you some information on relating to the history of God's actions in the nation of Israel I'm also looking for application for us here in the 21st century. But beginning at verse 1, Psalm 106, reading to verse 5, the psalmist writes, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord or, or can declare all His praise? Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have toward your people. O visit me with your salvation, that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Now, this is a psalm that is obviously unnamed, an anonymous psalm. And uh, as you go through it, you're going to see that it's a psalm that was written to highlight Israel's history but it's a history of unfaithfulness to God. You see, in spite of God's presence, in spite of His provision and His protection, Israel still had a habit of forgetting the goodness of God. I've been in Israel a number of times, and I've listened to an Orthodox Jewish guide speak concerning the nation, and, and often he would speak with flowing terms of the nation's history and, and God's goodness to them. I can remember various times that he would speak concerning the prophets and speak concerning just the history of the nation. And, and the way he would speak would be with such uh, glowing terms in relation to how God has been good to Israel. And, and even though he was doing that, um, one of the things I, I noticed was he never really mentioned to us Israel's history of unbelief and unfaithfulness. Because Israel has a history of that. And so as we look at this subject, that's really what he's speaking about. You see, sometimes when you hear somebody speak concerning the nation of Israel, they, for some reason, forget to mention the fact that um, they have been unfaithful to God for most of their history. When you study your Bible, Israel's unbelief is the subject of many portions of Scripture. As a matter of fact, as we've been going through the Psalms, we've seen a variety of Psalms uh, writing concerning their unfaithfulness. There are also entire books of the Bible that are dedicated to this one fact of Jewish life that the nation of Israel has historically been unfaithful. You can read the book of Jeremiah. You can read Ezekiel, Isaiah, Lamentation, and many other books of the Old Testament, and you'll discover that these are books that are written concerning the fact that the nation of Israel has sinned. You can read Daniel chapter 9, various other passages of Scripture, other books, and, and you'll discover that uh, the nation of Israel was under God's uh, judgment many times in its history. Not only do you see that in the Old Testament, but Jesus and, and Paul uh, and Stephen all made reference to the fact that the nation of Israel was an unfaithful nation. Uh, in Luke chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus was speaking here, and and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophet, stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. In Acts chapter 7, verse 52, the question is asked, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2.15, speaking of unbelieving Jews, said that they killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they do not please God and are contrary to all men. This particular psalm traces some of the unfaithful rebellion of the nation of Israel, and it reminds the reader of God's judgment on those who have rebelled against Him. As it closes, though, it closes with a prayer that the Lord would save and that the Lord would ultimately Deliver them. Let's begin reading together and look at this psalm first with verse 1, how he begins by simply saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God. You are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. So it's a call to all believers to praise and give thanks to God. The word praise, I mean, we read that all the time, especially in the psalms. 
Uh, what does that word mean? It's, it means to commend. It speaks of giving glory or boasting in. It speaks of celebrating. So he's saying commend or give glory to God. Now, why is it that he says that we ought to do that? Why is it that believers are called to celebrate God's goodness? Well, the reason is, is because he's worthy. The reason is, is because God is good. The reason that we praise him is because God loves us and God is merciful. In Jeremiah, in chapter 31, verse 3, the prophet Jeremiah said it this way. He said, the Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. I've loved you. I've loved you with a, an unbreakable love. I've loved you with an eternal love. And with my love, I have drawn you to myself. And that's how the Lord works, you see. And so we praise the Lord, and that's what he's saying, because God is worthy of praise. We praise him because he is good. We praise him, as he says here in verse 1, because his mercy endures, not just for a short time, his mercy endures forever. So he goes on in verse 2, who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord or can declare all his praise? Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. So who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Now notice, or, or can declare all his praise. In other words, God is much greater than any person will ever understand under heaven. We cannot fathom his depths. And it's the epitome of pride to think that we could. In Psalm 92, verse 5, the psalmist had said there, O Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. In Job 11, 7 through 9, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They're higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Romans eleven thirty three. the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. There are people sometimes who, who say, and I've heard this and perhaps some of you have too, who have said, you know, I'd like to talk to God. I'd like to question him. Think about that for just a moment. How absolutely absurd that truly is to think that any of us puny human beings with finite minds could ever really challenge God, could ever really argue with him. What that reveals to me is self-elevation and a denigration of God, elevating ourselves to something and reducing him to something, you see. It's the height of, of, uh, of hubris. It's the height of pride for us to think that we could put God in a corner and then begin to question him as if he is subject to us. The other day, um, just yesterday as a matter of fact, there were some kids here on the ground, they, grounds, they, um, they were riding their skateboards and I was studying in my, in my office and I could hear them riding back and forth right behind my office there and, and Mike, my assistant, came walking in and I said, Mike, would you do me a favor? Could you tell the kids not to ride their boards back here? You know, it's, it's making a lot of noise. Plus, the fact is, is uh, they might fall down, hurt themselves, break their legs, and then some parent's going to come over and sue the church. And so we have to be careful with that, you know, because churches do get sued now. I don't know if you know this. We, we had a lady who, who had uh, come as a visitor a few years ago now, and, and she had told her friend who had invited her, well, if I go to church, you know the roof's going to fall down. This is an unbeliever. And so when she got here, a gust of wind lifted up one of our... One of our um, little tents, little coverings that we have, and, and he hit her on the head. And uh, she sued us, and she got $20,000 out of her insurance. She tried to get a lot more, but she got $20,000 because something hit her on the head. You know, there are a lot of people, wish it would have hit her harder, but there are a lot of, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not somebody was going to believe that I mean that. I'm just teasing. I'm only saying what you're thinking. And I forgive you. No, um, <laughs> but she did. She sued us, you know, and got $20,000 from us, you know. And some people just don't have a sense at all, and, and they don't have a sense of the sacred. So these kids were riding their boards back there, and I, I said to Mike, could you please tell them not to do that? You know, I'm, I can't study. I'm making some noise, and they might get hurt. So Mike went out there, and the kids were right out there, and they saw him walk out, so they took off, as boys do, and off they went. And, but one of them was a little brave guy, and he stuck it out, you know. And Mike walks up to him and says, uh, you know, son, uh, you're going to need to stop riding your boards here. And the very first thing he said is, why can't I? You know, that's interesting. Why can't I? You know, and you know what Mike's response was? Because I said no. I like that. 
That's as direct as you can get. Because I said no. What, I owe you an explanation? You know, but there are a whole lot of people like that. I remember some guy years ago came into the church, years ago, and um, he pulled out a piece of paper and waved it in front of me and one of my secretaries, and he says, I have permission to come in here. This was when we were renting uh, an industrial park. It's been over 20 years, 22 years ago. And he walked in, and he, he waved this piece of paper, and he says, I have a right to come in, and I want to sell these pots and pans to you that fell off a truck or whatever, one of those things. And I remember telling him, you know, no thank you. He says, well, I said, you're going to need to leave. He says, well, why should I? I mean, that's the attitude that people have. When authority speaks, they don't want to listen. And if they do that with men like Mike and men like me, and they get away with it, well, there's a whole lot of people who think that they can do that with God. They think that they can, you know, when they see God, they're going to just give them a piece of their mind and they're going to put them in the corner and ask them some questions. And it just really shows the absurdity of how human beings really think as if they have some kind of right and ability to question God. And yet, that's exactly what happens. So when he asks the question, who can utter the mighty acts of God or can declare all his praise, we are not able to do that. We are finite, incapable of searching out the deep things of God, and therefore could never fully explain how wonderful and awesome he truly is. When he says in verse 3, blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times, he's simply saying because God is good and, and his love endures, well, blessed are those who desire to please him. You see, justice and integrity are the marks of a genuine follower of the Lord. And so he says, indeed, they are blessed. When he says in verse 4, remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have toward your people. He says, uh, visit me with your salvation that, that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. He's simply saying, as you bless those who love you and serve you, please include me in that number. Your promise is to those who fear you. And the promises of mercy and blessing, of prosperity. Uh, that's basically what he's speaking about, by the way, when he says that. In verse 5, notice how he says that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones. Uh, the benefit there, I looked that up in the original language. It speaks of blessing. It can speak of wealth. It does speak of prosperity. And he's saying, I want to be included in your hand. On, uh, I want to be included in those that you, you bless with your hand. Isaiah 45, 25 says, In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. And Paul in Galatians said it this way in chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. He said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. It is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So he's saying, those who have trusted you, Lord, I want to be part of that and I want to be benefited by you. I want you to bless me even as you bless those whom you love. Now, as he begins uh, by saying the Lord is worthy of praise, he now begins a place of confession. Notice verse 6. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity, and we have done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders, they did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Israel did not understand God's loving mercy as he was delivering them from Egyptian bondage. He is now going to begin to speak concerning the history of the nation of Israel in relation to its rebellion against a God who delivers them. And so he begins by simply saying that Israel didn't understand his mercy. They didn't understand what it meant to be delivered from bondage. They forget about the ten plagues of Egypt. They forget about his miraculous provision in the wilderness. Those things were simply forgotten. At the Red Sea, and notice how he speaks of the Red Sea. He said they rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. When, when God was doing a work there, they were forgetting how God had been providing all along. And and, and this really is one of those um, verses and one of those passages that helps us to understand that though you may believe in a miracle and, and though you may believe in a God who provides miracles and does miracles, and indeed we do, we believe in a miracle-working God, the fact of the matter is, is you don't survive on miracles or the belief that God performs them. 
What you survive on is faith in God through the hard times when a miracle doesn't come through. That's what you survive on, is the reality of knowledge that God is God no matter what happens. Like the children, uh, they call them the three holy children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were there in the fiery furnace, and, and Nebuchadnezzar had chosen to uh, put them to death because they refused to follow his de decrees and all, and and so they, play, they were placed in this, this fiery furnace, and, and Nebuchadnezzar was upset at them for their rebellious heart, and, and he said to them, you know, that they're going to be smoked, they're going to be burned. And, and then he asked the question, and, and, and what God is there that will deliver you from my hand? And, and the response was, our God is able to deliver us, O king, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down and we will not worship your image. We're not going to do that. Our God is able, but even if he doesn't, that's faith. You see, there are some who say, my God is able, and he doesn't. They lose faith in God because he didn't. They didn't think that way. My God is able. My God is able to do all things. But he is also God, and therefore he chooses what to do and when he's going to do it. And if he should choose not to, I still will not bow my knee and worship in the way that you're saying, you see. That's how it works, guys. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. And so when Moses was being used by the Lord and the ten plagues were coming upon the nation of Egypt, and each plague, as you know, represented a judgment of God on an Egyptian god where he was proving himself to be superior to their whole pantheon of deities. Ultimately, when they left and were beginning to move out, they came to the Red Sea. You know the story. And as they gathered there at the Red Sea, they looked behind and saw the, the chariots of, of Pharaoh coming behind and chasing them down. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 12 says... When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. They forgot what God had done, how God provided for them, how God delivered them, because the minute they had something tough in front of them, they immediately in their heart turned back to Egypt. And that's the point that he's making. We have sinned with our fathers. We've committed iniquity. We've done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt didn't understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Verse 8, nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. Now, the purpose of his miracles was in order to reveal his power, his power that is sufficient to save you. Not, is he, not only is he able to deliver you physically, he is able to deliver your soul. You see, when they were there and they were concerned and they were crying out, Exodus 14, 13 reads that Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And that's exactly what happens. Moses is crying out to the Lord, and the Lord God says to Moses, Why are you crying out? It's time for you to move out. And he causes the wind to hit the Red Sea. It parts the children of Israel cross as on dry ground. And when the Egyptian armies tried to do the same, God allowed the water to reconvene, to come back upon them and drown them, and their bodies were there found on the shore. And that's what they're being reminded of. 
But it's interesting how fickle they are. And the one moment they're saying, we're going to die here in the wilderness, and then the next moment, once salvation occurs, they begin to sing his praise. Notice verse 12. It says, then they believed his words, and they sang praise. Uh, they sang his praise. Verse 13, but they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. Verse 15 is one of the scriptures the Lord gave me a long time ago. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their souls. Belief in miracles alone does not save anybody. Notice how he says they forgot his works and did not wait for his counsel. You know, people soon forget how good God is, and so they can impatiently begin to make their own plans for their own life. God doesn't move quick enough, so we'll do something to please ourselves. Well, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all, not with some or when it's convenient. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. You see, that's the difference between a person who's maturing in the things of the Lord and the person who claims to be a Christian but is constantly worried about everything. Somebody who's learning to trust in the Lord isn't somebody who, by the way, just kind of like just goes through life with some kind of like... um, who cares attitude or anything like that. Christian faith is not fatalism. Christian, Christian faith is pursuit. We pursue the Lord, you see. Trust in the Lord is an active, it's an activity that we do. We actually are investing in him our trust. And as you trust in the Lord, you don't with just some of your heart, you trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And the reason we don't lean into our own understanding is because in our flesh there dwells no good thing. So our ways are not the ways of the Lord, and if we choose our own ways, then we may very well lead ourselves away from the things of God rather than embracing the things that are going to bless us. And so we have to be very careful to pursue him. In Isaiah 48, 18, the Lord said, Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river, your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Now notice verse 14. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, and tested God in the desert. So number four, Numbers 14 tells us that they wanted flesh. They wanted quail, so God gave them it. They spent two days and a night gathering flesh to eat while chewing on it. A plague broke out. That's what he's speaking about when he said they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the heart, in the, in the desert. Verse 15, he gave them their request but sent leanness into their soul. You know, sometimes God will allow you to have what you desire, but it isn't going to satisfy you. Um, You you can have desires for something that's just not good for you, and the Lord may be telling you all along, this really isn't good for you. I can remember, I've shared this with you a few times. Some of you probably will remember this this story, but I grew up in Norwalk, and in Norwalk in the 50s, in the early 50s, there were no such things as supermarkets, you know, what, what some of you young people have grown up with were really unheard of when I was growing up. There weren't supermarkets. We had little family stores. We had a, a store um, walking distance from us, probably a couple hundred yards. It was called uh, Billy's Market. And we would go there, and you'd buy your milk, and you'd buy some of the other things that you wanted and all. But that's basically what it was. We had neighborhood stores. There are still neighborhood stores, of course. We still see them. But that was the general thing. In 1955, they built Shopper's Market. Shoppers Market was that. It was, it was a lot larger than, than any of these little family-owned stores, and basically it was responsible for the loss of many of these mom-and-pop stores because it was able to stock the shelves with all kinds of things and all, and, and it was a big thing. It was such a big thing in Norwalk that when I was in kindergarten, we actually took uh, one of those um, days where the school takes you someplace, and we went off and, and went and looked at Shoppers Market as one of the things that we did. And all us kids, I can still remember walking through Shoppers Market, row after row of cereals and canned goods, and, and it was just like so amazing. Wow, check this out. It was really exciting for us. And uh, well, my dad took me to Shoppers Market one day, and we were walking through the, the aisles and all, and I saw this can, and it was yellow, and it had a purple uh, fruit on it, and it looked so good, and I, and I picked it up and held it. I didn't know what it was, but it looked delicious, and my dad said, you won't want that. I said, I want this. He says, you won't like that. I said, I want this. 
And he said, no, son, that's prune juice. Son, you will not like it. And I, and I carried it. I, I carried it following my dad like it was a baby. I remember walking with this can of prune juice. It looked so good. I mean, it was yellow and had a big purple piece of fruit on it. And, 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 and I was telling my dad, and it's the truth. I still remember doing this. It's funny how you remember some things. But I was carrying this, and I was saying, I want it. And then, and then I was saying, I love it. I love it. And my dad was saying, you're not going to like it, son. It's, it's prune juice. I love it. And so my dad bought it. My dad bought the can of prune juice, and I carried it home on my lap as we went home. And we got home, and, and I said, I want it. And my dad opened it up, and he poured it, in, and I got it, and I drank it, spit it out, threw it away. I hate it. You know, you can do that. You can do that. You can say, I want it. I want it. Now, it may not be prune juice. It may be a girl <laughs> or maybe a guy. It may be a place that you want to live. It may be a job. And you're saying to the Lord, I want it. It's my, I want it, God. I want it. I want her in Jesus' name. <laughs> you know. The Lord says, no. It's not good for you. I want her. I have a friend of mine, I haven't seen him for a while now, actually many years, sweet young man. He used to go to a fellowship I was an assisting pastor in. He was 17 when I met him. And uh, one of the guys, one of those kinds of kids that you just instantly like. I grew to love him. And he and this young lady began to date at the church, and I did some counseling with them and eventually performed a marriage for him. He had a heart for the Lord, and at first so did his wife. But you want to know something? They began to pursue some money. And, and I just heard just recently that uh, he's now a millionaire. He's a millionaire, but he doesn't serve the Lord anymore. He doesn't go to church anymore. He moved out to... Uh, down south, you know, in Georgia. He's a very wealthy young man, millionaire, with no hunger for God, no service to the Lord. And I can still remember when he began to move into the business that he eventually became a millionaire in. He came and spoke to me and asked me, what do I think? My advice has always been the same. Pursue the Lord. Keep him number one. Don't go in the wrong direction. Be very careful. You know, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in pursuing some, in pursuing it, some have pierced themselves, Paul says, through with many sorrows. When you put your mind on the wrong thing and you keep saying, I want this to be blessed. I want this. I want this. Well, he gave them their request, but he sent leanness to their soul. The word leanness speaks of famine. Material things will never satisfy you spiritually. Now, we older people have made a whole lot of mistakes over our lives, and probably most people around my age would say, you know what, discovered that. The almighty do dollar never does satisfy. But the funny thing about being young is you think, oh, that's because you were stupid. <laughs> you know, but I'm not, and I'm going to have both. And instead of learning from the errors of our elders, we think ourselves to be much more superior than they ever because they blew it, but I never will. And I've discovered that to be, to be true. Because many times when I speak to a younger person, not to say older people can't do the same because they do, but very often when I've spoken to the younger and I've said, listen, you need to set your priorities properly because this is the foundation of the rest of your life, they always think, well, I can start that tomorrow. But what I really need right now is a better car, a nicer place to live, better furniture, a 750 cubic inch, you know, engine for my car, and a giant TV set that takes up half the house. That's really what I need. And I need speakers loud enough to give me ear and nosebleeds, you know, so everybody knows that I'm cool. So when I'm bumping on down the road, my head is going like this, people know that I am extremely cool. You know, and that's just the way it is. And, and, you know, he says it. He gave them the request, but he sent leanness into their soul. You can have what you want, but you can walk away from the things that bless you. 
Verse 16, when they envied Moses in the camp and Aaron the saint of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the faction of Abiram. A fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. This particular incident is found in the book of Numbers. It's found in chapter 16. And what happened is there was a rebellion against um, Moses as well as against Aaron. You see, these men who are mentioned here, um, Dathan and Abiram, were uh, Levites. They were priests, and, and they spoke to Moses, and they said, you take too much upon yourself, Moses. We're equal to you. What gives you the right to make choices and decisions that affect our lives? And Moses was absolutely livid about that, and he went to God, and he spoke, and he said, are you hearing what they're saying? I haven't even taken a donkey from them. I haven't done anything that deserves this kind of response. And the Lord says, let me take care of them. And so what happens is uh, Moses goes to these men, and they're leaders of 250 family heads, so there are 250 men along with them. There are actually three. There are only two that are mentioned here, uh, Dathan and Abiram. And, and Moses says to them, listen, and he's speaking to the congregation, and he says, listen, if God does a new thing like the earth opening up and swallowing, swallowing them and their families alive, then you know that God's speaking through me. So what I would recommend, and he tells the children of Israel, I would recommend you get in a way as fast as you can because that's what's going to happen. And when he came there and they came and stood outside uh, of the door of their house, God opened up the ground, and the Bible says, and they were swallowed whole. And they went down, and the earth covered them up. And then the 250 uh, rebe rebels who were with them were killed by, by the Lord also. And so he made his point very clearly. And so it says that uh, they had envied Moses in the camp, Aaron the saint of the Lord. The earth opened up and swallowed Dathan, covered the faction of Abiram. Fire was kindled in their company. Flame burned up the wicked, and God judged them. Continuing on, verse 19, they made a calf in Oreb and worshipped the molded image. Thus they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham. Ham is another name for Egypt. Awesome things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. And so continuing on, it says here in verse 19, they made a calf in Horeb. Horeb is another name for Sinai. And uh, this is what took place. You remember the story there. The Lord had, uh, uh, had been meeting with Moses. Moses was receiving the law from the Lord. And, and while he was up there on the mountain with the Lord, um, the people thinking that Moses has perished began to prevail on his brother Aaron. And they approach him and they say, we don't know what happened to Moses. So what we want you to do is we want you to make us a god to go before us. And so Aaron says, well, um, bring your gold to me. So they bring their earrings and various articles of gold and he melts it down and he, he makes a, a golden calf. That's what's being spoken of here when it says in verse 20, they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. They made the, the golden calf. And as they did that, he's saying in verse 21 that they were forgetting God their Savior. He had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome things by the Red Sea. And so what happens is Moses can hear the sound and Joshua, his right-hand man, with him. And as they hear the sound in the camp, Joshua thinks it's the sound of war. But Moses says, I don't hear the cry. I don't, it's not the sound of war at all. He says, what I'm hearing is the voice of singing. In other words, what's taking place there isn't a battle. What's taking place there is a party. And he came down, and he approaches his brother Aaron. Aaron should have known better. What is it that, this that you have done? I don't know. He said, they brought some gold to me and dropped it in the fire and out came this calf. Oh, you meathead. That's not what happened. And they rebelled against the Lord, and that's what he's speaking about. And um, 
Moses had to actually intercede on behalf of the children of Israel. Notice he says in verse 23, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. In Exodus 32, 11, Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? And he interceded on their behalf. Then, verse 24, they despised the pleasant land or the promised land. They did not believe his word, but murmured in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he lifted up his hand in an oath against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their descendants among the nations and to scatter them in the lands. God had given them a promise. He said, I'm going to give you the land of promise. But they refused to believe his word and they rebelled against him in a place called Kadesh Barnea. What happened is... God had said, I'm going to give to you a place that is like, it's going to be filled with milk and honey. And because the people were concerned, he gave, he gave them permission to go with 12 representatives of the nation of Israel to spy out the land. And they went from the south to the north and all through it. When they returned and gave the report to the people, Joshua and Caleb said, it's ours. The grapes there are so enormous and and." and Everything is absolutely so incredible. It's ours. But the other 10 spies said, we were like grasshoppers in the sight of the giants who live there. And not only are we grasshoppers in their sight, which is interesting to me when you study the story there, not only are we grasshoppers in their sight, I mean, picture like me, I'm 5'8". And I did a baby dedication for a brother in our fellowship who has since moved to another place. I see him every year. But he's seven feet tall. And his wife is well over six feet tall. And I did a baby dedication for them. And I was holding their baby. <laughs> I mean, that was one big baby. And I remember holding that baby. Lord, thank you. Well, you know, that's only seven feet tall. Only. When you study your Bible, Goliath was nine feet nine inches tall. Nine feet nine inches tall. He's standing underneath the rim of a basket, and his head is just three inches lower than the rim. And when you proportion this man, you got to figure that this man, I don't even, I haven't got a clue how many hundreds of pounds he weighs, if Shaq weighs 345, and he's a little, little over seven feet tall, add two feet plus and proportion that, and then consider the fact that he's a warrior from his youth up. And this was an immense man. So when the children of Israel go into the land and see not just one giant, but giants everywhere, they're saying we're like grasshoppers in their sight. The average Jew during the time was probably about five foot four to five foot six. So you got to figure these people were twice as big as them. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. But the interesting thing, and we are also grasshoppers in our own sight. See, what happened is they saw the flesh with the eyes of flesh, but Joshua and Caleb said, they're going to be our food. We can eat them up and spit them out because we're not the ones who are going to fight them. God is. God is. And I don't think that God's afraid of a nine foot nine man. And that's how they thought. And so what happens is the 10 and their bad report, it, it, it took the spirit out of the others and they began to cry and say, Why did you bring us out here to die? And they rebelled again. And that's what he's speaking about. In, uh, in Numbers 14, 28 through 30, say to them, as I live, saith the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so will I do to you. Because they were concerned that their children were going to die and everything, he said, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered, according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above, Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, 
you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. Because you rebelled and because you have unbelief, you will not enter in. You will not enter in. That's what he's speaking about in verse 26. He lift up, lifted up his hand in an oath against them to overthrow them in the wilderness. Verse 28, they joined themselves also to Baal of Peor, eight sacrifices made to the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their deeds, and the plague broke out among them. Then Phinehas stood up and intervened, and so the plague was stopped. And that was accounted to him for righteousness to all generations forevermore. So continuing their history of rebellion, he speaks concerning what is referred to as their idolatry in Peor. In the book of Numbers, again in chapter 25, the Bible says Israel remained in Acacia Grove and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifice of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Israel was joined to Baal of Peor and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. You see, when you study the book of Numbers, you'll remember that there was this crazy prophet by the name of Balaam. And there was a king by the name of Balak who was trying to bribe him to bring curses against the nation of Israel. But Balaam said, I can only speak what the Lord has said. If God doesn't curse him, I can't. Three different times, they try to get him to curse the children of Israel, but you cannot curse whom God has blessed. And so every time he failed, and Balak was really upset, was saying to him, I could have made you a very rich man, but obviously you don't want the wealth that I can give to you. Well, ultimately what he did was he said this. He said, their God is a jealous God, and he has told his people not to intermarry with people who are pagan idolaters. If you will get the women to seduce the men, they ultimately will fall prey to the judgment of God, which is exactly what had happened. Listen, you can go all the way back to the Old Testament and go to the New, and you're going to find something that's a very common theme. God says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. God says, what in common does light have with darkness? What in common does God have with Belial, with the devil? Is there anything in common between the two? And the answer, of course, is no. So the question has to be asked, why would a Christian find a non-Christian so attractive? When the Savior that, that the believer, the Christian believer, embraces was tortured, humiliated, and put to death on a cross... And the unbeliever could care less about that, but the believer says, he did that for me, and I love him. So, if I'm really in love with Jesus Christ so much, then why would I embrace somebody who thinks he's worthless? If I'm really so much in love with Jesus, then why would I want to be with somebody, date somebody, love somebody, marry somebody who thinks that Jesus isn't worth the time of day? And you see that from the old, when God said, do not join yourself with unbelievers, to the new. That's the same common thing there, you see. And the way that, that uh, Balaam was able to get his, his money was by simply saying, look, it, I can't curse them, but God will judge them. And God will judge them if you can just get your ladies to go seduce them, which they did. And then, when this is taking place, a Jewish man comes into the grounds with a Midianite woman. Phineas, who was the son of the priest, sees this Jewish man parading this, this girl around, and she goes into the tent with the guy, and Phineas gets a javelin, follows them into the tent, and runs them through with the same javelin and kills them both. When he did that, God actually stops the plague that he brought on them. And that's what he's referring to here when he speaks concerning Phineas. Now, wasn't that encouraging? <laughs> Verse 32, they angered him also at the waters of strife, or Meribah, 
so that it went ill with Moses on account of them because they rebelled against his spirits so that he spoke rashly with his lips. Now, God originally, when they were coming through the, through, um, the wilderness, had spoken to Moses and said, uh, strike the rock and water will come out. Well, they, they started to protest once again, and the children of Israel later on, at the end of his ministry, basically, uh, once again were crying, saying, well, we need some water, and God says, speak to the rock and water will come out. Well, Moses had pretty much had it with these people. So he says, you rebels, must we smite this rock so that water will come out? And he takes his staff and smites the rock. Water comes pouring out. But God said, you misrepresented me to the people. I wasn't angry at them. You were. And because of that, Moses, after all of these years of faithfully serving me, leading them out, I'm going to allow you to look into the promised land, but you're not going to step foot in it. And what's interesting to me is the way the psalmist puts it. I want you to see this. Verse 32, they angered him also at the waters of strife so that it went ill with Moses on account of them. You know, sometimes even a righteous person can get so very frustrated at the unrighteous, and Moses certainly did. Sometimes even a righteous person can get upset. A disciplined person sometimes will become fr frustrated with those who are less committed. You might be serving here and you might be thinking, how come I and just a few serve in this particular ministry when there are so many others who don't? And you can get frustrated and you can misrepresent the heart of the Lord towards the people who aren't serving right now. Not to give anybody permission to not ever serve, but... Sometimes we can have a self-righteous anger towards them. Well, Moses certainly did, and he misrepresented the Lord. They rebelled against his spirit. He spoke rashly with his lips. Verse 34, they did not destroy the peoples con concerning whom the Lord had commanded them. They mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works, served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. The land was polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. God had commanded them to destroy the people, but they failed to do so. And the result was the idolatry of the people infected them. All the way in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 7, in the first few verses, the Lord God is speaking to the nation of Israel. And listen to what he says. These are their marching orders. He says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, Canaanites, the Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, Uptites, Outosites, and Cellulites. <laughs> oh, sorry. Seven nations greater and mightier than you. I've always enjoyed that one. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. They will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, and the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly." And that's exactly what happened. Rather than doing what God had called them to do, verse 34, they did not destroy the peoples. As a result of that, they were snared by their idolatry. You might think that you are stronger than temptation, but I promise you, your flesh is weak even if your spirit is willing. And there are people who think, well, you know, I used to be an alcoholic, and now my ministry is the bar, to go into the bar and sit there and drink a Sprite and visit with people. And before you know it, you're drawn back in little by little because you think you're strong. Instead of having the wisdom to stay out of those areas because you know that they're weaknesses for you, you start to think yourself better than you are, stronger than you are, and you end up failing in that. The pagan worship God knew would draw the people away from him. And that's what it means when it says in verse 39 that they played the harlot by their own deeds. Verse 40, therefore... The wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people so that he abhorred his own inheritance. He gave them into the hand of the Gentiles, and those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. 
Many times he delivered them, but they rebelled against him by their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. Though he showed patience in, for hundreds of years, ultimately they were overwhelmed. When you study the book of Judges, it gives great insight into the many times foreign powers oppressed the nation of Israel. And even after being delivered, very often they would return to their rebellion. Ultimately, they were exiled for that. In verse 44, Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. And for their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the multitude of his mercies. He also made them to be pitied by all those who carried them away captive. In other words, God would deliver them from the hand of their oppressors. The reason is, is because he honors his promises and he would deliver them. And he finally says, verse 47, save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say amen. Praise the Lord. God saves out of captivity. Even after he gives an entire historical panorama of God's faithfulness and goodness and Israel's rebellion, rejection, and faithlessness, still there's a word of hope for us because God indeed does save and God does gather us to himself. It's perhaps... Some in this room right now started out well and were doing well for a while. But you were tempted and drawn back. You were drawn back into the old lifestyle. You may not have gone full on into it yet, but you know it's only a step away. There's an enticement there. Maybe you're thinking of your old friends recently, an old girlfriend or boyfriend recently. You're beginning to want to go see them. Starting to think how boring it is to be a Christian you used to have friends before. You used to have things to do. Friday night comes and you're bored because there's nothing to do. You used to go out and party. You used to spend time with your friends and all. And the enticement is growing again. It's growing stronger. Well, the Lord would say to you, listen, don't forget the good work that he's done. One of the things that the Lord has used in my life, and I'll close with this. One of the things that the Lord has done in my life, especially when I was a new Christian, in the first few years of my walk with the Lord, and and if I may, when I first got saved, I was only in solid fellowship for three months. I mean, I got saved at the age of 20, December 27th, 1970. Next Monday will be my 34th anniversary of being saved. And, and I got saved at the age of 20 on December 27th. And so I began to go to Calvary Chapel of uh, Costa Mesa. I was 20 years old, and, and I went there for three months. But, but I had to go into the military. And so in March, March 15th, uh, 1971, I, I went into the army, and, and from there, I was three months old in Christ, and I had nothing but, but strife and trial and temptation and, and failure and then success and then failure and then success, and I guess you could imagine how tough it could have been for a 20-year-old kid who came out of five years of alcohol and pot, who had never really left even, you know, California, Southern California, other than to go to Tijuana. I mean, that's the furthest I'd ever been in my life, you know? And, and now I'm stationed all the way on the other side of the United States in North Carolina, and I'm by myself. I've got no friends whatsoever. And there I am in a barracks, and every night I'd go to sleep by, you know, you know nobody would be in the barracks. They were out partying, and, and it would just be me laying down in that rack there every night. And I'm getting bored, and I'm getting tempted, and I'm wanting to do things, and I'm lonely, and, and everything's happening over here on the left coast. We call it the left coast, on the west coast. And things are happening over here, and, and, you know, and nothing's going on in my life. And, and I start thinking, you know what? And then I'm bored, and, and I start making friends with guys who don't know the Lord, and before you know it, I'm being drawn back to smoking dope and drawn back to drinking beer and then starting to rationalize it. And I know that it is easy to just start slipping back and to have all of those excuses. I can remember on one occasion I had a toothache and there was no access to a doctor. So I started thinking, man, this tooth hurts. Rather than taking some aspirin, I thought I'll just drink a few beers and numb myself. That's how I handled things all the time. I never even thought of aspirins. You know, when you can buy a six-pack and, and numb your head 
why worry about aspirin? And that's kind of where I was at. And I didn't think there was a whole lot wrong with that. And then you start going back and forth, back and forth. And I can remember the early days. I can remember how Friday would come after I got out of the military and, and I'd gotten solid with the Lord. I actually joined a group called the Navigators and they helped me. And then I got out and now I'm free and, I, and nobody's watching me anymore and I'm not accountable to anybody. And before you know it, I'm walking on back, going back to the world because all of my friends are in the world. I, I don't see my Christian friends because they're not around anymore. And, you know, eventually, it, you know, it, it took me about three or four years of up and down Christianity. Even when I began to teach the Word, I was still being fought with. I was still dragging. I was still thinking, you know, I can have both. And finally, one day, the Lord finally got through to me, and He said, listen, it's an all-or-nothing thing with me. You're miserable because you're trying to do both. You're miserable because you're trying to serve me on Sunday, and then you teach a Bible study that you're not even practicing yourself. You got you to gotta make your choice. Are you going to be all or are you going to get away? I remember that very well. I remember that very well. Is it going to be all for me or are you going to walk away from me? What's it going to be? And you want to know what I obviously chose? No, it's going to be all of you, Lord. All of you. That was a little over 30 years ago when I finally said, I'm just going to, it's just going to be you, Lord. And even after that decision, there were still the temptations, there were still the inclinations, the old habits, the way of dealing with problems, because I never learned how to do that uh, before I got saved, and I had to learn how to deal with those things after getting saved. So I started remembering what Scripture said, and I started saying, well, God's Word's got to be true, and, and, and my, man, I was an alcoholic, so my desire to drink whenever I'm down or depressed that's got to go. That's got to go. This, this has got to go. It's tearing my life up. You know what happened eventually? You know, I, I, I used to say to the Lord, God, please take alcohol from me. God, take... How many of you know what I mean by that? Take alcohol from me. I used to, God, take alcohol from me. You know what I finally started saying? God, take the desire for alcohol from me. Fill this void that alcohol seems to have a place in my life. Fill it with you, Lord. See, guys, when I give you Bible studies and I give you warnings, you know why I give you warnings the way I do? Because been there, done that. Been there, done that. Failed. Understand what it's like to blow it. Don't want you to do it. Kind of like you, if you're a parent, are with your kid. Your kid thinks that you were born your age. <laughs> they think that you were always that way. They don't know you were a snotty little punk. They don't know what you were like. You know, some of you were great all of your life. I wasn't. My kids don't know my testimony. They only know the things I'm willing to share. But they don't know my testimony. They'll never know my testimony. God and I know the testimony, the real one. The one that I'm willing to share, I share with you. But only God knows the real one. And they, I didn't want them like that. I didn't want them to think like that, to do that, to be like that, to want that. And so you do all that you can to encourage them not to. And then they say, well, i got to learn myself. And you, you want to you wanna knock them out for 20 years. <laughs> then they wake up mature. <laughs> then you marry them off with some kid that you picked out for them in the nursery. <laughs> Your life can be a history of rebellion or it can be a history of faithfulness. There will be times that you're unfaithful. You confess, ask for forgiveness, you're restored. But when you turn around and look over your life, you're going to see that it was a steady movement towards the things of God. Or you can constantly be running back to the vomit. You can be constantly running back to the, 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 the mire that you were once washed from, like a little pig going right back, and be miserable. It's up to you. For me, I just made a decision. I don't want to be miserable. I was miserable enough in the world. I don't want to be miserable as a Christian. Because... Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. I want joy. So, Lord, I'm going to do the things that please you, and I'm going to forsake those things you died to set me free from. And I'm going to fall in love with you because that will keep me faithful to you. And in doing so, you will bless my life. You will bless me, even as the Scripture says, that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones. Lord, that's what I want too.